Last year, just after Christmas, Trisha and I visited Westminster Abbey in London. There we were shown a magnificent prayer which the worshipers at Westminster Abbey had used on Christmas. The prayer read as follows. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Mary and Joseph, and the peace of the Christ child be ours this Christmas. The moment we read that prayer, both of us knew that the phrases of that prayer would form the basis for my Christmas sermons this year. On Christmas Eve, we shall look at the concluding two phrases of the prayer, one during the communion services and one during the candlelight services. But today, we come to the perseverance of the wise men. Let us pray. Lord, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Amen. I suppose that we all get caught up in the frantic rush that is Christmas. I heard about a woman who, a few days before Christmas, went rushing off to the store because she suddenly realized that she had forgotten to send out Christmas cards. She picked up the first box that she saw. It was perfect. Red card trimmed in gold, bold letters in the center, Merry Christmas. Down at the bottom, a space to sign your name. She bought the box. She quickly signed her name to the cards, addressed the envelope, stuffed the card in the envelope. She used 49 out of the 50. And then she dropped them all in the mail. On Christmas Eve, she was cleaning her house. And she happened to cross the one card from the box that she had not sent. A thought occurred to her. She said, you know, I was in such a hurry the other day, I didn't even open the card to see the message on the inside. I wonder what it said. She opened it up, and here is what she read. This card is just to say, a little gift is on the way. <laughs> she collapsed in a chair. Realizing that now 49 of her closest friends were going to be expecting a gift which they would never receive. That is a part of Christmas, isn't it? The giving of gifts. Of course, it all began with those wondrous, mysterious figures the Bible calls the wise men from the East. By the way, I never cease to be amazed at the nuttiness this season calls forth from some who claim to be ministers of the gospel. I mean, did you read in the paper yesterday that Keith Sutton, the Bishop of Litchfield in England, declared that far from being lovable characters, the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus were, in fact, a part of King Herod's assassination plot. How absurd! In light of that foolishness, I want to tell you it's little wonder that the church all too often is being banished to the sidelines of life today. Let me tell you I don't buy that rubbish for a moment. Instead, I want to tell you how I view the wise men from the East. We can logically assume, I think, that they came from Persia, present-day Iran. 
that meant that they would have had to endure a long, hazardous journey over miles and miles of trackless desert wastes in order to make their way to the little town of Bethlehem. In fact, if you read the Bible really carefully, you will begin to realize that though the church tradition has it that the wise men arrived 12 days after Christmas, that as a matter of fact, they arrived after the presentation of Jesus in the temple, which would have been on the 40th day after his birth. That underscores, does it not, the perseverance of the wise men. They embarked upon this incredible journey, and they stuck with the journey the whole way. And furthermore, they would not be stopped by the evil connivings of King Herod. They were determined at all costs to see this special child for themselves. And they had gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. And they would not be stopped until they gave those gifts. The perseverance of the wise men. I've been thinking about those gifts. I've actually come to the conclusion that the, the gifts themselves can give us an insight into the wise men from the East. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but there is no subsequent history about what happened to those gifts after they were given. I've been thinking about that. And as I pondered the nature and the meaning of the gifts themselves, I've actually come to my own ideas about what happened to those gifts. Will you let me share those ideas with you now? Gold. Gold was the most priceless commodity in the world at that time. Gold symbolized royalty. With this gift, the wise men were designating Jesus as king, king forever. Do you realize that the visit of the wise men was the last of the good times for Mary and Joseph that first Christmas. You see, after that, everything deteriorated very badly. Jealous King Herod launched his massive search and destroy mission. An angel came to Joseph and warned him that he needed to take his family and flee to Egypt. And so Joseph bolted into action, gathered up Mary and the child and their meager belongings, and then they took off on their own long hazardous journey, this time to the land of the Pharaohs. Now, they were refugees, living in a land not their own with no means of support. Their status as refugees would carry on for a period of several years at least. I've come to believe that it was the gold of the wise men which became for the Holy Family a God-sent gift. That is to say, I believe that they used the wise men's treasure in order to support themselves during that long period of exile. I believe that Mary and Joseph used that gift of gold to ensure the life and the safe start in life of this child who one day would transform all humankind. 
Now, you know, I know that later on, Jesus would say some rather harsh things about wealth. There are actually some people who interpret his teachings to mean that he was calling his followers to repudiate material possessions. I, I don't think that's true. Jesus, whose early life, I believe, was preserved by the gift of some wealthy Persians and whose ministry was underwritten by a coterie of committed wealthy women. Read Luke chapter 8. Oh, I believe that Jesus understood that the problem was not wealth, but the abuse of it. It is the the misery created by selfish greed. It is the injustice practiced so many times by those with economic power against their fellow human beings. It, it is the exaltation of material values above spiritual values. That, in fact, is what I believe drew the denunciations from Jesus. There was, you see, no such greed in these affluent, prosperous, wise men from the east. They saw Jesus as king, king forever. And so they willingly, happily, generously gave him the very best that they could give. We can do the same. Gold is the symbol of royalty. When we come to Jesus Christ with our gold, yes, with our financial resources, we are acknowledging the right of Jesus Christ to rule in our lives. Like the wise men of old, we declare him to be King, King forever. Frankincense. Frankincense was actually derived from the sap, the liquefied sap of a lovely tree known to this day as the frankincense tree. The bark would be peeled back the liquefied sap would be harvested, and then that sap would be solidified into amber-colored lumps, which, when warmed or heated, would give off a lovely fragrance. Frankincense was used to purify, to make pleasant the air, the atmosphere in the temple. And that's why frankincense came to be the symbol of divinity. With this gift, the wise men were designating Jesus as Lord, Lord of all lords. The years in Egypt sped by. Somehow, I think, with the gift of the wise men's gold, the Holy Family managed to survive long enough. Long enough for King Herod to die. Long enough for it then to be safe for them to return to their home in Nazareth. Once there, well, life began to fall into familiar patterns. The boy Jesus, the Bible tells us, grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and others. In time, youth gave way to adulthood. And Jesus, apparently, took his father's place, his earthly father's place at his carpenter's workbench, apparently, to support his now widowed mother and the other children in the family. That went on for a period of years. 
And then there came a day, one day, when Jesus, their own Jesus, was scheduled to lead the weekly worship at the synagogue in Nazareth. You know what I think? I think it was then that Mary went to the place where the choicest treasures of the family were kept. And there she picked up this precious box of frankincense which the wise men had given to her son so many years before. And I think she took that frankincense to the synagogue in Nazareth and there used it lavishly to purify that place to prepare that place to hear the lovely word of God from the lips of her son. And we know because the Bible tells us that it was there then at the synagogue in Nazareth that Jesus for the very first time delivered the message that he was in fact God. God in human form. And in fact we are told that the people in the synagogue that day were so stunned by what they regarded as his outrageous claims that they actually turned on him. They attacked him. They tried to kill him. It didn't stop him. You can't stop God no matter what or how you try. You can't stop. Do you understand what I mean when I say that while there was no beauty after the worship that day in the synagogue at Nazareth, that in a sense, the fragrance of the frankincense associated with the appearance of Jesus began to move out of that synagogue, out into the world, spreading throughout the world the lovely fragrance of the Son of God. Do you understand what I mean when I say that that day his neighbors rejected him? But multitudes without number ever since have claimed him as Lord. You see, whenever people see Jesus as the wise men saw him, as the Son of God. Well, when they open their hearts and their minds to his message, their lives are changed and transformed. It is no accident, I think, that Matthew is very careful to tell us that when those wise men saw Jesus, They knelt down and paid him homage. They worshipped him as Lord. By God's grace, he gave those wise men eyes to see what so many people never see, that Jesus Christ is God. God come to this earth in human flesh. Wise men brought the gift of frankincense. We can do the same. Frankincense is the symbol of divinity. When, like the wise men of old, we kneel down and worship him as Lord, we are saying, Lord, I want to own you as my Lord. And when we own him as our Lord, then our lives are changed and transformed. He is Lord, Lord of all Lord. Myrrh, like frankincense in a way, myrrh was extracted from the sap of a tree. Not a lovely tree this time, but actually a a scrubby, ugly 
little tree. But the sap of that tree became the basic ingredient in those days for perfume. It also was used as a painkiller. And then it was used as the anointing substance for the bodies of the dead, preparing them for their burial. That's why myrrh became the symbol for sacrifice. With this gift, the wise men were designating Jesus as Savior, Savior of the world. You know, I, I think Mary somehow in her heart understood what most people miss, that Jesus was born to die. And I think that she took that urn of myrrh and stored it away, knowing, though just the thought of it would be like a dagger to her heart, knowing that one day she might need it for her son. And I think that that day, when she joined Jesus for the final trip to Jerusalem, I believe she went and got that urn of myrrh and packed it with her things, her mother's intuition telling her that her son's time had come. And on the Sunday morning after the crucifixion, I think she took that urn of myrrh and with her friends she hurried out to the garden tomb, there intending to prepare the body of her son for its final rest, only there to be greeted by the thundering announcement, He is not here, He is risen. That's why I think that the myrrh was the only gift of the wise men which was never used. Here is the part of the Christmas story not often told. Those little hands So soft were fashioned by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary so that one day nails might be driven through them. Those tiny little feet so pink, so completely unable to walk were made so that one day they might climb a God-forsaken hill there to be nailed to a cross. That sweet infant's head with sparkling eyes and easy smile was formed so that one day a crown of thorns might be forced down upon it. That tender little body, so warm, so wrapped in swaddling clothes, was made so that one day it might be ripped wide open by a spear. Jesus was born to die. Yet, his death is in no sense a tragedy. For out of his sacrificial death and his subsequent resurrection, there has come nothing less than the salvation of your soul and mine. The wise men brought the gift of myrrh. Myrrh, the symbol of sacrifice, 
and salvation. When we come to Christ as the wise men came to him, we are saying, Lord, you took my sin as your own. You gave your own life for me. Now I beg you, make me your own forever. Jesus was born to die because Jesus was born to save, to save you and to save me. Sacrificial Savior of the world. Oh, my beloved people, I plead with you to take Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life this Christmas. For if you do, then you will come to know him as I know him. King, king forever. His Lord, Lord of all lords, as Savior, as our only Pray with me, please. God on high, hear my prayer. Enable us like wise men of old to worship Jesus Christ as King, as Lord, as Savior. 